Now he's come to us in our worst hour, in the time we wanted, would have wanted no one to see us, yet he was there, and loving us, and mercy and grace, and it's amazing, isn't it? We think about how his life came to a close there in the garden. They came and, uh, to arrest him with soldiers and spears and thinking they were going to have to fight through to get to him. And he stood up and said, I'm he. They all fell backwards. And they got back up and arrested him anyway. And Peter cut off one of the ears of the guards and one of the servants there that was trying to put... Jesus in some type of shackles, perhaps, and Jesus bent down, picked up the ear, and healed the man. Yet, they arrested him anyway. You think about what hard hearts that could do that, and then we have to be reminded that we're made of the same stuff. And the Bible says our heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? And they took him, and they took him to a mock trial, an illegal trial. They mocked him there, and they looked for any way to find fault and could not, except that he claimed to be God, that was all. So they whipped him 39 times over and over until he would not even appear to look as a man. And then they would punch him, beat him, and mock him as they blindfold him, saying, tell us who that hit you. Who was it that hit you? And they plucked his beard from his face, and they took him put a cross on his back to lead him away. Our Savior did all this for you and for me. And they get to Golgotha there and the Romans were trained in crucifixion how to make it the most painful, brutal death possible. That's why they used that method. And they would nail him to a cross in his feet and his hands and raise it up and drop it down into a hole and dislocate bones in his body as they did that. And there he, the crown of thorns already beat upon his head, would bleed and suffer and die. For me and you, love and grace mingled down as his blood flowed. Salvation there, full and free for all who would take. And Jesus calls out, even you read the last few verses of the book in Revelation, he's calling still, come. Come, come. He that would drink of the water of life, come freely and drink. And our Savior's heart and attitude always is reaching, uh, desiring those that would be willing to receive Him. And what a Savior we have. And he did all that for you and me. And salvation to this day yet is extended. And we're excited to see young people being saved, old people being saved, anywhere in between. And grateful for these that are going to give testimony of that by way of baptism that as a picture of what Jesus has already done in their heart that they know that he has come into their life and what a beautiful picture of death to self and burial of the old life now raised to walk in newness of life just like Jesus died for us and was buried and rose again. That's our Savior. What grace if you're not saved here today can I plead with you. Jesus didn't do that for someone else. He did it for you. He died on the cross, did all that for you, so you could be saved, so you could know Him, so you could really know life. The Bible says in Ephesians, ye who are dead in trespass and sin, ye hath He quickened, made alive who were dead. The only real life is eternal life in Jesus. And He wants you to know true life. Life in Him, eternal life. What a Savior we have. If you are saved, what's that worth? What is that salvation worth? Have you ever thought about that? What do we owe Him? Does something inside you long to do something for Him who's done so much for you? See, this is why He saved you. Let me read Ephesians 5, 8. For we were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. See, this is why He saved you. We were darkness, but He's brought us into His glorious light and made us lights. And He says now, walk as children of light. How in the world are we going to do that? 
how am I to walk as a child of light? How do we find? Where are we going to find how to do that? Did God write a book? Has he given us a book? Well, absolutely hadn't he. The word of God. I'd like you to take the Bible and go with me, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter 5. We're coming to this study of the Beatitudes on this journey with Jesus this year, our theme, and we're walking with him through the gospel record of Matthew. And we've come to Matthew chapter 5 here. And one of the big problems that people have when they come to the Bible is they have presuppositions many times as they approach the Word. Uh, preconceived notions or, or assumptions, if you will, or theories about the Bible, rather than coming to it just as it is and letting it speak for itself. Every, when we do that, everything we read is controlled by that presupposition or that assumption or that theory or that, uh, that preconceived notion that we have or idea. Uh, just for instance, if you'd let me give an example of that, if you thought this morning that as I preached here and talked to you that I was a liar, if you thought that he's trying to just manipulate these people, he's trying to just simply... Uh, get something from them or uh, use them for his own means in that type of way. And some people have that feelings about pastors, preachers. And unfortunately, there have been some wrong pastors that were wolves in sheep's clothing that have brought reproach on the name of Jesus into the office of a pastor. And that's a shame. But if you viewed it in that way versus the view of saying, this pastor, this man, as his truth, loves me. He loves these people. He desires to give his life for the sheep. I'm not talking about in death. I mean every day, giving my life for the sheep. That's my desire, as Jesus did. Giving his life day by day. And he's still giving it every day for us. I'm not talking about in death, but in life. He's daily. He's right now interceding for us, see. If you believe that I loved you and that I was giving my life for this flock and that I honestly long to please Jesus more than even to please you. And that's why I would preach the truth even if it may hurt or it may be hard sometimes to preach it. But I long to please Him more. If you believe that, and depending on which of those presuppositions or assumptions or preconceived idea or theory you brought to the table would determine how you heard everything I said. That's what we might call a filter. That everything is filtered through that because of some idea or presupposition brought to what is heard and how you would respond would be affected. So if you come back to the Word of God as we were talking about, uh, if you believe that the Bible is God's Word and truly God's revelation of Himself to us, if we believe that, it's inspired, it's inerrant, it is preserved for us, like he said he would. Or if you come to the book doubting it, like the world does, or mocking it, as even liberal theologians might do, questioning it, it's going to make a huge difference to how you respond or hear it. And so our attitude towards the Scriptures is paramount. There's nothing more important in the Christian life than your attitude and belief of what this is. If it is God's word or not. Is it truly from him? Billy Sunday said, Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. So what do we believe? Well, we should believe it's God's word. And then let the Bible speak for itself as the Holy Spirit would guide us. As you know him as Savior, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was sent to guide us into all truth. As we read his word, he would teach us. Praise God for that. And we should compare Scripture with Scripture. Let the Bible speak for itself. You see, really, truly, we know nothing about God apart from this book. This is how we know Him, see. Uh, know nothing about the Christian life, in a sense, apart from the Bible that God's given us to know Him. And that's why we say the Bible is our sole authority for faith. The Bible is our sole authority for faith what we teach, our doctrine, what we believe and teach. The, the Bible is our sole authority for our practice, how we behave. See, that's what we say as a church. 
Why are we baptizing this morning? Why do we have a tank full of water? Why are we going to put these three beautiful young ladies to get their hair all wet, you know, and put them under the water? Why would we even bother with all that? Unless we believe what we find in the Bible is true, and this is what God has told us to do. See, that should govern everything about our lives, not just in this place, in these hours, but every moment of every day, if we call ourselves Christians. See, you can't rely solely on just experience, because they're subjective. Not only that, there's false spirits in the world, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? There are counterfeit experiences. Now, you've heard them, I saw Jesus standing at my bedpost. Or saw a 900 foot Jesus and he said, you know, I just, I want to get to the word of God, see. And by the way, when it comes to God's word in our life, we all must agree that it's not enough just to read the book. Not enough. You say, what do you mean? Well, if we just merely read the Bible, it's possible to read it in a mechanical manner and analyze it like you're analyzing a Shakespeare play or something rather than reading it for what it is. It's not just to be observed. It's to be lived. It's to be done. Hey, it's a good thing to read, but if we only do it so I can say, I read the Bible, I read the Bible every day, if that's all, and we get up from that without any thought into it, without any application to our life, without any consideration of putting it to practice in our life and meditating on it throughout the day to allowing it to change my life, then truly we've just observed and not applied. See, God wants it to live in us, to become a part of us, that we truly live out that book in our daily walk. If you're just merely reading it, it can be quite profit profitless. I say again, our approach to the Bible is of vital importance. How we view this book. You say, well, goodness, Pastor, you're making a lot about the Bible this morning. <laughs> Well, it's because as we come to the Sermon on the Mount, and what it tells us in, in, in this book right here, it zeroes in here on the Beatitudes specifically right here we're going to read. Unless the Lord by His Word transforms our thinking and our minds, it's not going to make any sense in the world we live in. Not only that, we think this is so foreign, this is so old-fashioned, this is so outdated, except the Lord change our thinking from the world's thinking. You cannot walk as children of light. But he said, you're not no longer in darkness. He's brought us into his glorious light, and he says, walk as children of light. I know how to walk as children of darkness. That comes natural, doesn't it? We all can do that. We agree with that. We're all sinners. No doubt about it. The Bible says we all have a sin nature. My children don't sin and become a sinner. They sin because they are a sinner. Just like their mama, right? And their daddy, too. <laughs> right? They sin because they are one. And that's what we all are. We are a sinner. That's why we sin. And so we know how to walk that way. Now God saved us. He's given us a new nature. I don't know how to walk like that. And neither do you. So we must get in this book and let it change us. So we can walk as children of light. Can I say again, that is the one thing this world needs? People walking as children of light that affects everything. Light affects everything. You ever been looking for something and finally just like, I'm so stupid, I'm going to turn on the dumb light so I can see, right? It affects everything. You ever been eating something, it's like, it's all right. And you think, well, why not put a little salt on it? Because salt really affects everything. And God says, you're salt and light. Everything you touch, everywhere you go, you'll affect it. You'll change it because you are salt of the world. You are the light of the earth. Think of what God's given us. Matthew chapter 5. Now let's read together with that introduction thought. Look at verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, he being Jesus here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's not natural for people of the darkness. For they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Hallelujah. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you and men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. That's what they did to him, didn't they? Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. <laughs> what? Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which are before you. By the time you get to the end of this book, that's how they treated Jesus himself, didn't he? So I want to bring you this message entitled this morning, The Big Picture of the Beatitudes. What's the big picture? What's God have for us? We're going to look at them individually in a different message, but what's the big picture here? Let's ask God to help us, please. Lord, would you bless the reading and preaching of your word? Would you have your way in hearts? Would you open eyes? Would you open our minds and our eyes to see what you have? Would you open our hearts to hear and believe what you've told us? That's something that this preacher, I cannot do. But by your spirit, you can. So we're asking your Holy Spirit to have free reign in every life. Save the lost. Draw the saved nearer. The backslidden back to you. We'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now all of us would agree, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, what we just read there, that this is not live like this and you will become a Christian. It's not that. Right? That's right. Well, then how is it? It's not live like this so you can become a Christian. Well, then how is it? It's we should live like this because we are a Christian. See, that's totally foreign to us without Christ. And even with Christ, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, by the Word of God, to even think this way. This is how a Christian ought to live. This is how Christians are meant to live. This is what Jesus is saying. This is how my kingdom would be. I want you to notice chapter 4. Yeah, look at verse 23. Would you notice there with me? It says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching their synagogues, and preaching, what? The gospel of the kingdom. And here he would say in the very first of Beatitude, he says, yours, you poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom of heaven. This is how God's people ought to be. That's what he's preaching here. This is how my people that I will change and call into this glorious light, this is how they'll walk as children of light. See, that's what he's trying to help them understand. And thank God he's given that to us to see. Now, look, some want to argue about are there seven Beatitudes or eight Beatitudes or nine Beatitudes. I'm not interested so much as the number as what God says about the Christian here. What does God have for you and me? We should be perfectly clear. This is what we're interested in. And like I said, I want to look, kind of take a general look first. What's God saying here for us? I feel often in certain aspects of the truth uh, that can only be grasped as you look at a passage as the whole. In fact, nothing leads more to heresy than when someone wants to get into some specific portion and ignore the whole. And so we have to look at the whole here, the message God's given us, the Sermon on the Mount, and the Beatitudes here where we're looking this morning. In Bible study, it should be invariably the rule that you must start with the whole before you begin to pay attention to the parts. What's the point? What's the main idea, the big picture of what God is telling us from this passage? I want you to notice, he says over and over, verse 3, all the way through verse 11, he starts with what word? Well, good for three of you. Let's see it again. What word does he start with, church? Blessed. Blessed. What's he talking about? Well, let's be honest. Happiness is the big deal for everybody in this world. That's what they're seeking. Happiness. I want to be happy. This word blessed has to do with happiness. It's not happiness that circumstances only brings. This is a happiness that God gives, a joy that the Lord gives, that circumstances, praise God, cannot affect. And he's saying, blessed over here, blessed. And how can I be happy in this world? They're looking to try pleasure. And they come up empty. That's what the woman at the well found. She had five husbands, and now living with another man who's not her husband. And what'd she say? I've come up empty again. I'm empty. Until she met Jesus, right? People are trying 
power, if I could reach some position in my work or in my career, then I'd be happy. People are trying all types of things like that. Money. Oh, if I had this money. People are trying drugs, aren't they, more and more. Some way to be happy. That's what I want. Happiness. And it's tragic, really, to observe ways people are seeking it. The vast majority are seeking happiness in a way that is bound to misery. It's, it's sad to see. You know, the ones in our world that they think, they made it. They, they, they're at the top. They made it, whether in business, whether in entertainment, sports, you name it. You look at their lives and you're finding they're as miserable as they started. And even more so because they thought that would make them happy and it didn't. They're still unsatisfied and they're drugging themselves. Still looking for some way. We just got a report the other day, if you follow the news, Prince, this pop artist, there's no wrongful doing in his death, they say. It was all on him. See, even killing themselves, they're, going so, they're so unsatisfied with life. Yet how many times as Christian people, the things we're giving our effort and energy and things in this life is simply to make the world a better place from which to go to hell. We're seeking the same thing the world is, to have some position, to have some house, some boat, some car, to have a certain amount of money and security. It's the same thing the world's seeking. And Jesus is going to say in this message in chapter 6, verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, a desire to be right with God no matter what. And all these things be added unto you. I've called you away from what the world thinks of what am I going to eat, what am I going to wear. That's the things the world's worried about. You say, well, I don't know about that. Well, how many of you already said, what are we going to eat today after? <laughs> right? That's what's on our mind. Why do you think all these restaurants and all these stores and Amazon on our phone and online, what are we going to wear? We... That's our, that's God said, my people aren't called to that. I've called them to something much higher. The great purpose is I've put them in my father's business. That's what the Lord wants. Don't you see that here in this thought of happiness, blessed, is the utter deceitfulness of sin comes in. Always offering happiness and always leading to unhappiness. You've seen the beer commercials. The guy's never throwing up in the gutter. Or police behind him, he's pulled over. Or he's just killed somebody. You don't ever see any of that. The guy's drinking, good-looking people around him. Everything's a good party. It's a lie. It's the deceitfulness of sin, see. Promises happiness and it brings unhappiness. There is pleasure in sin for a season. The Bible tells us, but after that. Read Proverbs. Who? Who hath redness of the eyes? Who hath woes? And who has wounds without cause? And who has all these problems? He that tarrieth long with one. I'm, that's just one example. But we're, the deceitfulness of sin to finally it leads, leads to misery and wretchedness. The Sermon on the Mount says, however, if you really want to be happy, let me tell you how. Here is the way to happiness. Can you imagine a group of young people? <laughs> if I was speaking to a college graduation, let's say UAB or Montevallo that's near us or something, and I was saying, young people, you all want to be happy in life. Oh, yeah, tell us how to be happy. I'll tell you. You want to be happy in life? I say, be, be poor in spirit. They wouldn't say, yes, that's what we've been looking for. How humility, poverty, and spirit. Not at all. We almost admire a boastfulness about people. Our president's that way. Uh, a boastful attitude, we almost admire that. Uh, Glenn Robinson, a number of years ago, uh, this is back in the 90s, a basketball player, I think he's retired now, his son's playing. But Glenn Robinson, they offered him back then $70 million to play basketball. And he said, I turned it down. He said, I'm worth $100 million. But how many people watched him play and thought, wow, what? He was a superstar. He was someone that a lot of people looked up to. I mean, and you could, we could go on and on the rest of the time about stuff like that, couldn't we? We almost admire people that are boastfulness. Deion Sanders ran a touchdown after he left Atlanta and went to uh, Dallas Cowboys. And Deion Sanders, uh, afterwards, they interviewed him and he pointed at his teammates and it used to be teammates there as he ran it back 98 yards or whatever uh, there at the Atlanta Georgia Dome, which doesn't even exist anymore. But he said, he said, this is my house. I built this house. Just the arrogance, the boast. We almost admire some of that. 
God said, blessed are they. You want to be happy? How many want to be happy? Be poor in spirit. See, that so goes against the grain of the American dream. Do what you want. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You can have it. Do it. Want it. Take it. I'm telling you, except this book transform our mind. We're not going to get it. You say, why do you fuss about coming back on Sunday night and Wednesday night and revival meeting, Mr. Conference? Because I want you to expose yourself to this book as much as possible because that's the only way we can live as Jesus saved us to live. Walk as children of light. We've got to be in this book every day on our own with Him. Lord, teach me how to walk as a child of Yours. If you really want to be happy, this and this alone is the type of person who's truly happy, truly blessed in life. Number one, I've got five things. I'm not going to preach them all this week. We'll look at them next Sunday morning. We're going to look at three this morning. Number one, all Christians are to be like this. I just want to look at some principles right here from this general look of the Beatitudes. Number one, all Christians are to be like this. We've read them already. I won't go through them all again right here. But these are a description of what every Christian is to be. Now, this is one of the places that error has tried to creep in the church right from the beginning. You read in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, you'll see the Lord Jesus, as he stands and talks to the seven churches of Asia, he'll mention a couple times this word. You may not know what it means, but it means he, he mentions the word, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Jesus says, which thing I hate. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So what does that mean? It means clergy and laity. It means a division there. That there's two types of Christians. This is something that the Roman Catholic Church really made popular. You had priests that you would go to and they really were spiritual and they would then go to God. Let me tell you something. We have one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. See? But this idea has crept into our thinking that there's people that are really spiritual Christians and then there's all of us that's little ordinary Christians. You don't find that in the Bible. Not once, not any. Not at all. It's a total lie. There's not exceptional Christians and ordinary Christians. They're not the clergy and the laity. There's not professional Christians that do that for their occupation and those that, who are engaged in secular affairs. You don't find that in the Bible. Not at all. It's a total lie. That lie is not only completely unscriptural, it's destructive. There's no such distinction in the Bible. I say it again, there's no such distinction in the Bible. Jesus Christ has called all of us to this great calling on this journey with Jesus to be His disciple, to get in the yoke with Him, to learn of Him. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He wants you to walk with Him as a Christian. Are you a Christian? That's enough. Walk as children of light. No matter how you pay the bills, He's called you salt. He's called you light. Changing everywhere we are and everything we touch, salt and light. So what do you mean, preacher? I should not have, I should not have any more love for Jesus than you have. I'm not saying I do, but I shouldn't. I should not be more committed to Jesus than you are. Did Jesus die for me more than you? Did Jesus' blood shed, was it for me more than for you? Not at all. I should not serve God with any more fervor and passion of my life than you do. Are you a Christian? That's enough. God has called you to this life, to walk as children of life. I should not be any more concerned with soul winning than you are. I should not be more concerned with discipleship and discipling those that are saved. The great commission the Lord's given us to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the, name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, than teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. That's discipleship. That's you and me with the ones we've seen saved. Teaching them one-on-one, -on -one, helping them like Paul did with Timothy. I should not be any more concerned with that than you are. The world missions, getting the gospel around the world to the uttermost. 
I should not be more concerned about that than you are. This is something that we are Christians and God has called us to. Why should you not be more concerned, Pastor? Because we're all Christians. Jesus died for all of us. We all possess the Lord Jesus Christ within us in the person of His Holy Spirit. He's come to live within us. He's changed us. We're invited on the same journey with Him. And He doesn't have first-rate Christians and second-rate Christians. We're not going to stand in heaven one day before God and He's going to say, all right, now, were you a... Okay, so you weren't a pastor. You weren't in full-time Christian service. Okay, well, there's a different standard over here. Not at all. This is how we're going to be judged. Jesus himself said, I won't judge you. This book will judge you. And there's, no, there's not two different realms there. That's a lie that's been put out there, and we've swallowed it many times in America. Well, I do something else full-time, preacher, and stuff. We're all to be full-time Christians. He's put you there as salt and light. Don't you see that? He's placed you there. Walk as children of light. Your heart ought to beat like His. If Christ is in you, for souls. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He is seeking men through you this day. That's what He desires to do. We're all Christians. We're not going to get to heaven and find out something different. It's not going to happen. Show me that in the Bible. This is what's going to judge you. We are salt, light, we are called to be witnesses of His, period. Aren't we? Do you find something different? Not at all. This is what He said, isn't it? And look, it goes into every area of ministry. From ministering to children, young people, adults, through the bus ministry, van ministry. Jesus is, in all of us is working. We ought to have a heart for the youth ministry. Uh, children's ministry. Oh, how Jesus loved the children. Uh, the Jesus Christ that's in all of us ought to have a heart for that. Uh, nursery. How about that? So the preaching can be heard clearly. So mothers can listen to the preaching. Every decision in a service, by the way, I believe the nursery worker and the children work in super church and those have part, have part of that fruit. It abounds to their account, part of that. My wife should have no more burden and heart for the nursery than any of you able-bodied ladies. Not at all. Why? Because we're all Christians. We all have Christ's life in us. This is not merely a description of Hudson Taylor. I'm saying the Beatitudes, they're not merely a description of a life like Hudson Taylor or George Mueller or Jim Elliott. Not, not that. It's a description of every Christian. Let's forever get rid of that false idea. As we think of principles we draw from the beatitude, number one, all Christians are to be like this. Number two, there are differences. So pay attention. All Christians are to be like this. Number two, all Christians are meant to manifest all of the beatitudes, all of these characteristics. Not only are all Christians to be like this, but all Christians are to manifest all of them. You say, what do you mean? Uh, it's not, well, okay, yeah. He's really, he's really poor in spirit. And oh, over here, she really shows mercy. And this one over here, no, 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 no. This is not something that's natural. This is something that God has done. Not only are they meant for all Christians, but of necessity, all Christians are meant to manifest all of them. It's not right to say someone's to mourn, in spirit, someone's to mourn, someone's to be poor in spirit. No, every Christian is to have all of them at the same time. Everyone displaying these things. You say, that's impossible. That's where Jesus comes in. That's where he comes in. And not only that, but each of these necessity, uh, of necessity implies the other. You say, what do you mean? When you begin to be poor in spirit, humble before God of who you really are, if I begin to be honest with God that I'm a dirty, rotten, black-hearted, hell-deserving sinner, that's what I am. But Jesus... It's easy to humble myself then. And if I get poor in spirit, that's what it is, humility, then it's easy to then begin to mourn. It's not talking about someone that lost a loved one. It's just talking about mourning over our sin. It's talking about what brings us to repentance and mourning of who I am. Do you see Isaiah? He was a prophet already, but he saw God high and lifted up and in the presence of God, he says, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a prophet of unclean lips. The Bible says that 
The angel takes the coal from off the altar and touches to his lips and says, now you're made clean. Then he was ready to serve God. See, we've got to see ourselves poor in spirit, mourn without hungering and thirsting. You cannot mourn about your heart condition without beginning to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want to be right with God. I want to be right with Him. See, they all connect. You can't do that without being one who's meek. One who's a peacemaker. All of these connect together. Each one of these, in a sense, demands the others. Number three, all Christians are to be like this. All Christians are meant to manifest all these characteristics. And thirdly, none of these Beatitudes refer to what we may call a natural tendency. None of us were born this way, is what I'm trying to say. These are not personalities or natural tendencies. There's nothing natural about them. In fact, they're totally spiritual. Nothing natural. Each one's produced by grace alone and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and your life. That's how they're produced on us. I can't emphasize that too strongly. Uh, there's some that people might look at and say, naturally, boy, that person seems meek or poor in spirit. Then that's not what this is talking about in Matthew 5. Because it's nothing of our nature. This is of a whole nother nature. It's Christ's nature. It's Christ being formed in us. It's the mind of Christ happening in us. It's us crucified and Christ now living in us, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. This is what he's speaking of here. This is the Christ life. This is what Jesus exemplified. It's the work of God in our lives. Nothing natural about it. It's the work of God in your life. If we yield to him. We'll get in this book, friends, any of us, every one of us, no matter our personalities, our tendencies, our things that are natural from birth or not, if we would allow God to work in our lives, is meant, each of us, as a Christian, to this describe our life. Not only are we meant to, we can. We can be like this. We can. That's the central glory of the gospel, isn't it? To take someone that's so proud and so arrogant and to make them poor in spirit? That's a new creature. <laughs> Therefore, any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm going to read someone in history that was really proud. John Wesley was, I don't know if there's any more proud man than he was. But when he got saved, you find he became very poor in spirit. See, that's the glory of the gospel, how it changes someone. It can take a non-singing man and make him so interested in the will of God and God's work in us and so disinterested in what he may think or what she may think or what someone else may think, but I want to glorify God. God changed me. So how is that possible? Because it's different now. Jesus came in. It's different now. He's changed us. So we conclude this morning, yours. Did you see that? This is a great promise. Did you catch it as you went through? Look at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs. He's talking about to you, Christian. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours is comfort. Yours is to inherit the earth. Yours is to be filled. Yours is to obtain mercy. Verse 8. Yours is to see God. Yours is to be called the children of God. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Yours. This is what God saved you for. This is what God purchased for you on the cross of Calvary, that all this might define your life and you receive these blessings in your life. That's for the Christian. This is yours. This is what God purchased for you. You were saved. All of Him. You say, why don't I have all these things in my life? Now, let me back up. You were saved, if you're saved here today, it was all of Him. You didn't do anything. I didn't be a good person and get to heaven. I didn't do enough good things to make it into His family. No, it was all of Him. He says, the wages of sin is death. That's what I needed. That's what I deserved, I mean. That's what I was going to have. That's where I was headed. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our salvation was all of Him. What did we do? 
just received Him. We just received that gift. Then, can we go with that same idea into the Christian life? You must live the, the Christian life to walk as a child of life, uh, of light, to uh, live this beatitude life. It must be all of Him. You know as well as I, when you came down to this altar to get saved or at your house or wherever it was and you kneeled and said, Oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. And you know it. But I believe you died for me. Come to my heart. Save me. Change me. You asked Jesus to come into your heart. You didn't say, Lord, you know I deserve it. You know how good I am. No, not at all. If you did, then you're like that righteous man that went back to his house unchanged. But we all got down like the publican. Lord, I'm a sinner. So why do we get up from that and think I can walk the, in the Christian life and have these beatitudes without getting down and say, Oh Lord, you know how dirty, rotten, sinful I am. You know what I'm like. You saved me now. I need you to walk this way. I'm dying to myself. But your life, your spirit have control in me. See, it's all of Him. Our salvation was all of Him. Uh, to walk as children of light is all of Him. Without me... He can do nothing. Isn't that what he said? Lord, don't we need to pray? Lord, I can't live the Christian life, but you can. Through me. I die to myself. I give you the throne. I'm yours. You call the shots, Lord. I'm yours. You control my schedule. You control my family. You control my finances. Lord, it's all yours. You, it's all of you. See, it's all about the Bible. You say, that doesn't sound very much like what we think. It's all about the Bible transforming our thinking, transforming our life. You know why it's so important to keep in this book? To be here, like I said, Sunday night and Wednesday night and to allow yourself exposure to the Word of God, to every day be in this book. You know why? Because it's the only hope of pulling our mind and thinking away from the world's way of thinking and the philosophy of this world. I know many of you, you work in a secular environment. And I don't, I don't, I, I'm privileged. I don't, at this time, have to work outside of the church. And I'm thankful to God for that. But I know you work in a secular environment, and even if you don't, we're bombarded constantly by this world and the philosophy of thinking. We're bombarded at the workplace. We're bombarded in our neighborhoods. We're bombarded in the entertainment. We are bombarded by this thought that says over and over, do what you want to do. Get what you want to get. Be what you want to be. Go where you want to go. And the only hope that our thinking, that our mind would be changed is and brought into the, what the will of God is for our life is that this book would change it. The only hope of having a blessed life as God wants us to have is that this book change it. Because we're bombarded constantly with the wrong philosophy of life. Aren't you bombarded like that? Constantly. Mary was, and I were talking just yesterday about a nail polish, these nail polish lines and some of these makeup lines and the names on them are as wicked as possible. Lust. Tempterous. Isn't that just, that's just a small example of the bombardment of the way a young lady ought to be thinking as she's putting this on. What? I want to make someone lust for me? I want to be a temptress to someone? It's just constant, isn't it? The way of thinking is bombarding us. Psalm 119.9. I'll end with these scriptures and I'm done. Would you listen with your heart? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed therefore according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against thee. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, ye you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind.
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. Ladies, feel free to say amen. Ephesians 5, 25, husband loves your wives. Well, I gave you a chance, ladies. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God says you can't do it without the washing of the water by the word. And neither can I. Because we're all Christians. And we need Jesus Christ to live within us. Let's bow in prayer.